Yes. Okay, great. So welcome to the last webinar of uh, 2021. And the, our topic for today, disaster preparedness in hemodialysis units. Uh, two years ago, most of us have, have had less, uh, less understanding of necessity of preparing for potential disaster. But after COVID-19 pandemic started, we all have more awareness that unfortunately, bad surprises can come on our way. And in such situations, knowledge and experience is the power. And having the knowledge of what to do and how to react in what if situations empower staff to better and quick reactions, which in the world of nephro nephrology can be equivalent to save lives. And this is true for staff and for patients alike. And for that reason, actually, uh, we decided that uh, the topic for the today's seminar, uh, webinar will be disaster preparedness. I would like to invite my colleague from the Executive Committee, Anastasia, to present our speaker for uh, the webinar. Good afternoon from me as well. Um, and uh, thank you for coming to this afternoon's um, we webinar EDTNA from EDTNA ERCA. I'm Anastasia Lusatin, one of the EDTNA ERCA Executive Committee members. Um, I work uh, in Kefalonia General Hospital in Greece, and I have the honor to introduce you to our guest speaker, Professor Raymond Van Holder, who is the president of the European Kidney Health Alliance and uh, Professor Emeritus from uh, Ghent University in Belgium. Professor Van Hondel, welcome to the CDTNA ERCA webinar, and thank you very much for accepting our invitation to speak on this important topic of disaster preparedness in uh, hemodialysis units. Professor, the screen is yours. Then we're gonna start, good afternoon. Everybody, thank you very much for this very kind invitation. And from the start, I want to apologize for the previous time because I missed uh, that one. And uh, I fully take the responsibility for that. Um, so I hope that still uh, a lot of people will have come to listen to this presentation. As you can see, I'm not only going to speak about earthquakes because uh, I want to discuss with you disasters at large. So we are going to start uh, with our experience with er earthquakes because we build up uh, quite a lot of experience in there with the Renal Disaster Relief Task Force. I will come back to that later on and hopefully there are also a number of nurses who were involved in this who are among the audience, um, especially Stefan Klaus. I hope he is there and can also tell us about his personal experience because he did several interventions. But at the same time, I'm sorry, we are going also to discuss other disasters and we will finish with COVID-19, which in fact is also a disaster because it is affecting such a large number of patients and um, of um, medical personnel. Um, now, disasters, uh, as you can already understand from the title, uh, are not simply um, limited to earthquakes, but earthquakes are very important disasters and also quite intense um, in certain areas. But apart from that, there are also other what we call natural disasters. And unfortunately, there are also a number of man-made disasters. Uh, and these, these became uh, more important recently, uh, war and terrorism more specifically to name the most important ones. But let's first talk about earthquakes. This is uh, something that actually does happen only over a very short period of time. Um, and when uh, different um, um, tectonic plates are hitting each other, uh, and as a consequence, if they are happening on uh, the surface of the earth, then a part of the surface of the earth is moved and that is giving all this shaking and the destruction to buildings. But in fact, this is um, the Marmara earthquake to which I will come back several times uh, during this presentation. And if you look at the time scale, the real earthquake is lasting only 45 seconds, but 45 seconds is pretty uh, long for an earthquake. And um, 
On top of that, um, it is uh, followed quite immediately by afterquakes and sometimes afterquakes are more destructive to the buildings than um, the primary earthquake itself. Now, if we look at the, uh, uh, the map of the world, then large areas of the world that are inhabited are prone to earthquakes, apart from the fact that many earthquakes are uh, occurring in mountain areas and uh, uh, at the bottom of the sea where nobody lives. And as a matter of fact, everything that is right, uh, red on this slide um, is earthquake prone. And that means quite some densely inhabited areas such as the Californian Fault with Los Angeles and um, San Francisco, the whole Mediterranean, um, Southeast Asia, uh, the Far East, and um, also a number of uh, really uh, very much inhabited cities like, for instance, Tehran, which is at the crossing of uh, three different faults with 15 million people of inhabitants, and of course also Istanbul. Uh, also 15 million or even more nowadays, where in the aftermath of the Marmara earthquake, these authors were calculating the risk for a severe earthquake um, in Istanbul, a more severe earthquake than the Marmara earthquake in the 50 years to come after that. Um, and that risk was calculated at 65%. Now that was calculated in 2000. Uh, of course, now in the meanwhile, more than 20 years are gone and nothing happened. Um, there are uh, still 30 years left, but on the other hand, we should realize that in earthquake prone areas, the longer an earthquake does not occur, the greater the risk that it would occur in the nearby future. Now, if we are looking at the most severe earthquakes, as far as is related to the number of deaths, you will see that the total number is about one and a half million, and that is certainly an underestimate. Mostly the counting um, does not take into account people who uh, disappear uh, or tourists, uh, and probably this number in fact is higher. At the same time, you will see that among this list, there is only one earthquake in uh, Europe, that is in 1908 in Messina, Italy, that is uh, at the place where uh, the, the south tip of Italy, Reggio di Calabria, is joining uh, Sicily. Um, and uh, everything else is uh, occurring elsewhere. Um, but perhaps more importantly is that four of these events were occurring in this century. And that is, to my opinion, an illustration of the fact that um, the earth is more and more densely populated and that especially destitute people, people without resources, start living um, in areas that are in fact dangerous. The first uh, uh, real in-depth description of the kidney problem that we are discussing today um, and everything that is related to it, uh, that as a whole is called the crush syndrome, was not described during an earthquake, but during the London Blitz in 1941. Although there were previous descriptions, amongst others, uh, at the occasion of the Messina earthquake, but also um, in, during the First World War, where people uh, fighting in the trenches were covered by rubble and developed uh, acute kidney injury. But as already said, the most in-depth description was during the London Blitz. That's when Hitler started bombarding uh, London City and also other major cities um, of, uh, of the United Kingdom. Um, and in this uh, event, about 40,000 civilians died and many civilians also were uh, trapped under the rubble of uh, collapsing buildings. And in this way, uh, Dr. Eric Bywaters was the first to make this in-depth description in the British Medical Journal. Now, Eric Bywaters is an interesting person because uh, he ended up not as a nephrologist, but as a rheumatologist. And in fact, he is one of the first, or one of the first to introduce uh, corticosteroids for uh, the treatment of autoimmune disease. But in this uh, paper in the British uh, Medical Journal that, by the way, 
uh, was meeting a lot of opposition from uh, the settled uh, scientists. In this uh, paper, he is describing a number of problems with which we still are confronted nowadays. Here on top, you see oscillometry, that is a technique to measure the pulses of arteries in the affected limbs, more exactly the legs, and where you see that in one leg, the signal is really almost going to zero. That means that no blood comes through it, and that is due to this other fact that is the swelling of the limbs, which is due to the fact that all the rubble came on the legs, that muscles have been damaged, uh, get inflamed, and as a consequence, attract water, and uh, that attraction of water makes the legs swell. But at the same time, there is not enough water to keep the kidneys going. And here is this other problem, the almost disappearance of urinary volume, which is the signature of acute kidney injury. And as you know, in 1941, there was no dialysis. The first more or less modern dialysis was instituted in 42 by Pim Colvin Company in the Netherlands. So there was nothing to treat these patients and all four of them in the description died. That this was a major and even epidemic problem during earthquakes became only clear um, in the aftermath of the Armenian disaster, that's the Spitak earthquake in 1989. Not that this problem had not been there in previous earthquakes, but probably the diagnostic means and also uh, the therapeutic possibilities, for instance, with dialysis were not present and nobody had registered this in detail um, as a, a real massive uh, problem. Um, now, the problem with Armenia, and probably again, some people are still among the audience who participated in this intervention, is that uh, it started um, only with a delay of the earthquake, while the country itself was not organized at that moment. It was very closely after the Iron Curtain fell, so there was no real well-established dialysis over there. The consequence was that um, uh, doctors and nurses started, started entering the country uh, about one week or even later after the disaster uh, with uh, dialysis material, but at the moment where the most severe patients had already died and many of the others had recovered kidney function, and that was a bit of a problem. So there were many people around, but in fact, uh, not much could be done uh, at that moment, and that was the reason uh, why, when the International Society of Nephrology realized that there should be a, a, some, some sort of more and better organized um, rescue, and that was the birth of the Real Disaster Relief Task Force, which involved a number of volunteers, of doctors, um, nurses, technicians going to help in uh, the occasion of severe earthquakes where the local uh, people were had difficulties to cope with the problem, and that was logistically and also for political and other reasons done together with Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, who supported this initiative very strongly. And the first time the task force became operational was uh, in the aftermath of the Marmara earthquake that was in the late summer of 1999 and occurred in the areas in between uh, Ankara and uh, Istanbul. And I come later to uh, later on to this back again. Now, uh, at the moment we started in Turkey, we were, had really no experience and we had more or less uh, to invent ourselves. At least that was uh, my impression. Um, but with uh, the accumulation of several interventions, we learned a number of things that I think are very important, not only for earthquakes, but if you a little bit modify the background, it applies as well to other disasters. Of course, it's not never exactly the same, but I think the philosophy is quite often similar. So one of the first things that is obviously needed is severity assessment. And there we need to realize that many factors are contributing 
but in, in a very different uh, degree, the intensity of the disaster, I think that needs no explanation. The population density also, if nobody lives there, then of course nothing happens. But also the structural characteristics of the buildings. Uh, say, um, if you have a very tall building, uh, but built in function of uh, of earthquakes, like you have in Japan or in California, then uh, nothing will occur. And if you have a very low building, uh, let's say um, a, a ramshackle hut somewhere in Africa, then also nothing will occur. Um, the really dangerous thing is buildings in between, let's say five, six stories high, but not entirely safe in uh, earthquake circumstances. And then there is, of course, the timing of the disaster. Um, if this is happening during the day, then most people are up and around and in the street and they are not affected. And those who are inside and who are affected get everything on the head and they are usually immediately dead. In contrast, if this is occurring during the night, then people are lying down, then there is much more risk to get all this rubble on the muscle, on the legs. And that is the type of earthquake that gives a lot of kidney problems. And then, of course, there is the efficacy of rescue activities. If um, uh, there is a, a, a bad rescue, then you will have not much uh, kidney problems. If the rescue is very good, then there will be more kidney problems. And this makes that sometimes quite similar earthquakes regarding the number of deaths give a totally different uh, number of, of cases with crush syndrome, of cases with kidney problems. For instance, in this North Indian Gujarat earthquake, there were about 20,000 deaths and only 35 people with acute kidney injury. But in the BAM earthquake with a similar number of deaths, there were three, four times more people uh, with uh, acute kidney injury. And remarkably, in the 9-11 attack with more than 3,000 deaths, there was only one single crush case. Why? Just simply because most of the people had lift the, uh, or left the building and they were saved. Nothing occurred to them. And those who were in the buildings, when they collapsed, they were immediately dead. So that makes that there was only one single crush syndrome. And if you would calculate a ratio of the uh, number of dialyzed over the number of deaths, then you can see that there are quite a substantial differences. For instance, with the highest number here in the Marmara earthquake in Turkey. Why? Well, because uh, this was a typical example of, uh, of high, the five, six story high buildings, but that were not really safe combined with a very efficient rescue activity. But at the other side of the spectrum, you see this value of zero in Padang, Indonesia, just, just simply because these were very primitive uh, buildings and something similar in Haiti in the Port-au-Prince earthquake, there the figure was 0.1. But there you need to realize that the number of deaths were above 300,000. 300, so there was still a quite substantial number of crush syndromes, but the ratio was extremely low just due to the sheer number of uh, deaths in total. Roughly, one can make a sort of estimation of when really kidney problems will occur. And the help in this is that the US National Geographic Institute, which gives a warning for earthquakes above an intensity of 5.5, also gives an estimate of the number of fatalities. This, for instance, is an earthquake in Iran. Uh, where their prediction is that uh, in between 100 and 1,000 fatalities will uh, be registered. And the, here the counting indeed stopped somewhere above 200. So that is quite exact, but one can estimate that the real sufficient number of kidney problems will only occur from 5,000 on to a higher number uh, of uh, victims. And then there is the need for medical intervention at the disaster site. That is prophylaxis, actually, it's prevention. And this prevention is really 
extremely important. It is the administration of fluid, preferentially when uh, the victim is still under the rubble, one has to find a vein in arm or leg, or one can give a subcutaneous infusion and early administration of fluid is really very important. Um, and if that cannot be done in the field, then it should be done as soon as the patient is out or at the latest moment from the moment he or she enters um, the hospital. Why is this? Well, there's a complex part of physiology of uh, the acute kidney injury, and I will not discuss you with, with you in detail. But the essentials are the water accumulation in the muscle, which I have already described. Of course, that water does not go to the kidneys, and that makes that the kidney function goes down. But together with this, the muscle is also releasing myoglobin, that is the oxygen carrier comparable to hemoglobin, that is in the muscle. And that myoglobin uh, is uh, going to the kidneys and over there. Um, is getting stuck like a kind of jelly in the renal tubular system if urine flow is not sufficient and the consequence is what we would call blockage of the kidney which can only prevent it be prevented if from the start enough fluid is given and this jelly is flushed out of uh, the tubules and we are quite happy to see that in more recent earthquakes, uh, quite often people released from under the rubble were indeed receiving a timely fluid administration. There is the problem of uh, local health facilities. The hospitals may be damaged here. That's again Istanbul that was in full summer. The hospitals were damaged, so people were treated outside. That's of course something that you cannot do in the depth of winter. And some people have been suggesting that this might be solved by starting field hospitals that are happening in tents, but we are not very much in favor of that uh, for several reasons. First of all, because a field hospital um, does not have all the infrastructure around um, and that uh, would make uh, that you have not perfect surgery care and intensive care. And uh, for that reason, we think that it is better to uh, move the patients when they are still in a decent uh, condition um, and move them then to secondary or preferably tertiary hospitals um, at close but safe distance from where the earthquake occurs. The problem is with field hospitals, they treat patients for a week or two weeks and then patients have to be moved and then they are so sick that problems occur. So the Novo dialysis units, we don't like it. Um, we had once, we were once obliged to dialyze in the damaged area that was in Port-au-Prince because the, 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 um, the epicenter of the earthquake was, was exactly in that city and um, Haiti is a a, a country with very little infrastructure. As a matter of fact, there was only one dialysis unit and that was there in Port-au-Prince and there, um, and I think Stefan Klaus can explain this even more in detail because he was there. They had they install themselves in the dialysis unit in very primitive circumstances. As a consequence, the intervention in Haiti um, was probably one of the most difficult ones involving most people and where the, the, the satisfaction, the success was relatively compared to other earthquakes deceiving. People treated on the streets, people um, uh, treated under a canvas bashes, extremely ugly wounds, um, primitive treatment here, uh, patients with leg fracture, where for traction, uh, some stones uh, have been used by lack of anything else. And then uh, treatment in primitive, um, very basic hospitals or tents, which is something to be avoided. So these are the reasons why we don't like the whole solution. Aftershocks may further damage hospitals and then you're in trouble. Keeping positions open for untransportable cases is important. And locally treated patients have a higher risk for mortality, um, but transporting is also not everything. Roads are damaged. Railways are damaged, 
uh, as a consequence, transport uh, over sea um, or through the air, planes or helicopters may be a solution. And one important thing, I come back to that in a minute, uh, potassium uh, is a real killer of those patients. It's uh, paralyzing the heart. So you, one has to take away as much potassium from the bloodstream as possible and administration of potassium binders before transportation is essential. Then uh, what occurs is a kind of overflow of patients like we have known with COVID as well. A number of these patients have acute kidney injury but do not need dialysis, but the number on dialysis is increasing dramatically, certainly at the beginning, then goes down again. Some people recover kidney function, some people are just simply discharged, but some people unfortunately also die. Although the mortality rate of acute kidney injury in these circumstances is obviously much lower than the classical patient that we have nowadays with sepsis and so on in the intensive care unit. The practicalities of all this um, are quite important. One, uh, several things you have to consider. First of all, geographic redistribution, that is that you can take away patients from the damaged area, also chronic disease patients, uh, maintenance dialysis, and bring them to other places. And this is better planned in advance. That is also one of the key messages of this presentation that is advanced planning. Um, so geographic redistribution is quite important. In one of the units in uh, Marmara, we just kept the unit for acute patients and put uh, the chronic patients uh, elsewhere. Consider to go there for several shifts a day in Marmara at a certain moment, we were dialyzing almost all day. And also for the chronic patients, reschedule them, maybe one dialysis per week, two dialysis per week, depending on uh, the possibilities, um, and then uh, cope with the rest of the problem with diet. The planning is something very important. Um, this is a, 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 an illustration of the macro planning on national level, but the same planning needs to occur actually in um, a hospital that is when a disaster can be expected and it occurs, then there must be one coordinator, uh, one that person that takes the, the lead, but of course that person may be affected himself by the earthquake or his family um, or his house. And if he or she is not available, then you need to have a backup um, and um, a, even a second backup and a third backup that uh, if some people are not available, um, these can be replaced. And this is needed for every level. For instance, of the dialysis unit, it is uh, obviously not only a thing for the doctors, but also for the nurses and also for the technicians. So advanced planning is very important. Many of the measures um, and much more extended, uh, all this is described in these recommendations um, for the management of crush victims in mass disasters, which is an open access uh, issue from nephrology, dialysis and transplantation. Again, this is about crush, but it can easily be extrapolated to other disasters. Hyperkalemia, we have had this already. This is a major problem um, and uh, should be avoided. But what we have seen quite often is that people are receiving, um, uh, receiving potassium containing fluids. You see a, a few of them, they're crossed at the bottom of this uh, slide. But uh, you have also ringers lactate. And I think that, of course, doesn't make sense in a population that is at high risk of hyperkalemia. Uh, giving potassium containing solutions is, is some kind of counterintuitive thing, but it is easily done, especially by surgeons. So that is something that needs to be looked at with very much attention from the moment uh, such a patient comes under your hands. And then you have the fasciotomy. Um, sorry to be so negative about surgeons, but it's also one of their uh, things that is that they, they very much like to cut 
um, in the skin of the legs. Of course, those legs are swelling. The rationale is that the swelling may damage the muscle, that these people may develop a drop foot. And to avoid this, this to do this kind of fasciotomy, um, ideal thing is uh, shown above here, um, a very clean wound. But the thing is that this is done without objective parameter. Normally, one must measure the pressure within the muscle and uh, this pressure must, must exceed uh, the blood pressure or come very close to the blood pressure. And then there is a rationale to do um, this kind of intervention. But if it is done without objective parameter, then you are increasing the risk of complications like this uh, ugly infection of the wound that would be a cause of sepsis and sepsis, as you know, is killing people, is also worsening acute kidney injury or causing acute kidney injury. And then very, a very brief word about dialysis. We are very much in favor in these circumstances for intermittent hemodialysis from the medical side. Um, it is easy to remove small water soluble compounds uh, like, for instance, uh, potassium and also bring down uh, the volume of the patient in case of hypervolemia. And practically, it is something that can be used uh, several, the, the same machine can be used for several patients in a day. Um, and uh, there is also no need for anticoagulation or only a, a brief period of anticoagulation. And all this um, in, uh, is not there for continuous treatment where anticoagulation is all the time. And we have seen literally people bleeding to death because of this continuous uh, treatment. And there is also not an efficient removal of potassium. And also for peritoneal dialysis, the potassium removal in these acute circumstances is insufficient. I have promised you some other disasters. I will very be very brief on that. Floods are a real problem. As you know, they're becoming more and more severe um, with the heating of the climate. And uh, we have had a few examples here in Western Europe, in Belgium and in Germany during this summer. Um, and if a dialysis unit is too close to a river, then it may be affected by floods and um, then stop uh, working. So actually in the architecture of hospitals, probably for the future, we will have to take into account this issue. But floods are also causing damage to the kidneys, for instance, by extending the area over which um, uh, some infectious diseases are propagated. For instance, in this uh, study in China, it is very nicely shown that malaria incidence goes together with the flooding seasons. And as you know, malaria is also one of the causes of acute kidney injury. And a bit in parallel with this, we have also hurricanes, uh, actually hurricanes, and then in the Asian area, also typhoons. Um, and also these are propagating a number of uh, diseases that are causing acute kidney injury. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and certainly that was the case for New Orleans uh, with Hurricane Katrina, you got this um, huge problem of number of dialysis units that were affected. Unfortunately, um, the um, American, the, the Kidney Foundation, the US uh, Kidney Foundation, um, and the American nephrological community in the aftermath uh, developed a number of recommendations on how to deal with this problem. Um, now, importantly, hurricanes can easily be predicted. So that is, if you could say, a sort of advantage compared to um, to earthquakes. Um, but uh, one of the things that followed this was was that people, patients, really got quite good instructions where to go if their unit was damaged. Because now, with the circumstances that we had with Hurricane Katrina, people were missing a number of dialysis sessions and as a consequence developed complications and their hospitalization rate was higher. And then we have this terrible thing of man-made disasters. There is, of course, war and war is very similar in its pathophysiology to earthquakes with the only difference that quite often the infrastructure 
is even more severely damaged and also um, the way um, med medical treatment can be given and external support can be given. There is the problem of irradiation that I would briefly like to touch upon. Um, irradiation that can occur in nuclear wars. Fortunately, we did not have any uh, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also uh, with damage to nuclear plants like we have seen in Chernobyl um, or also more recently in Fukushima um, when um, we had that earthquake in Japan um, that was followed by uh, the flooding of uh, the area. Because the radiation dose is certainly uh, related to a risk to develop chronic uh, kidney failure. And we have, of course, also this other recent uh, disaster that was the refugee crisis. Refugees are at extremely high risk of chronic diseases um, and they are neglected. They do not get the proper treatment. Um, and if uh, they get it, they get it too late. They suspect or they do not trust the local circumstances. So this is certainly something that policymakers need to take into consideration and that has been insufficiently considered uh, up till now. And we finish with what we are facing today, COVID-19, which is certainly not gone. On the contrary, with o Omicron, we don't know what's going to happen. And even with the Delta variant, it's also far from brilliant. So I just, uh, although you probably must know most of these, I made a small list of what can happen to the kidney population. Of course, CKD patients are more susceptible and have worse outcomes. There are outbreaks in hemodialysis centers. They are, those are affecting both personnel and uh, patients. It's a closed community. It's like a retirement home. So once it happens, if, you, if it doesn't happen, nothing occurs. For instance, in our unit in Ghent, as far as I know, in the first wave of COVID, um, there was no case, but later on there were. Um, immunosuppressed patients are more susceptible and have worse outcomes. That is a real problem in transplant patients. Their immune system is gone, but there are many other kidney patients receiving corticosteroids or other immunosuppression. There is a, a dramatic drop in transplantation rates each time such a wave is occurring. Now it's a little bit better. There are a number of recommendations, but still it happens every time. There's a high risk of acute kidney injury. I come back to this in a minute. PD catheter insertions postponed. I don't think this was a real problem in Europe, but some of you may correct me. I think uh, it was a problem in UK. I do not consider that anymore as Europe, excuse me for the, for the British, um, but it's outside the EU, let's say in Canada and the United States, but maybe it happened elsewhere as well. A high need of technological material. I come back to that also in a minute. A lack of protective material. I come back to that. And the personnel, of course, and especially the nurses who are in close contact with patients and who have this huge infection risk, which is a problem not only for them, but also for their families and um, a, a cause of, of real uh, mental uh, stress that uh, obviously must have an impact on, on the functioning. Acute kidney injury, according to this early US data, more than 50% of hospitalized patients. And uh, um, then about uh, one third of those is dying. And of course, and that can be expected, the severity of this acute kidney injury is defining the outcome. Here on the left, you see no acute kidney injury and then the different stages, the up to the very severe stage, and the dark bar is showing the mortality. So with each stage, mortality is going up. That's something that we can um, expect. It's a, a kind of septic syndrome with um, cytokine storm, etc. The whole uh, bunch of things that we are aware of together with pulmonary problems. Shortage of dialysis material. 
we remember what happened in New York during the first wave. But again, this is also a question of logistics. And as a matter of fact, they, they were giving continuous treatment to their patients. And like with earthquakes, continuous, one machine, one patient. So you cannot make a rotation. Somehow there was not enough advanced planning or not enough flexibility to modify this into um, intermittent dialysis, which would allow them to treat much more patients than um, what they had at that moment. And shortage of PPE, of, of protective material, of course, less now. The governments have taken care of this. That was a real problem in the first wave. But still, I think there is a problem because changing and putting on all these clothes all the time and then putting off, replacing, etc. It's a, a huge waste of time and it is a cause um, of, of, uh, of, of exhaustion. Uh, and also of mental exhaustion, and that brings me to uh, almost the last slide of this presentation, this huge risk of burnout that has been neglected. If someone is thinking about it, then probably they will think about intensive care and not about nephrology, but it is as big for, for us and certainly for nurses. There is this increased need for hemodialysis, um, like described in our paper uh, in the beginning of this year, a shortage of medical personnel and material, um, which leads then to burnout and then people drop out and there is a, a lack of personnel deficient hemodialysis. And so you get this kind of vicious circle. We think that burnout must, that first of all, there is again a need for advanced planning, what to do with burnout. And also there is a need that this is recognized well in time uh, because the later it is recognized and treated or uh, corrected, the more damage occurs. And I think the nurses have been neglected about this aspect too much. Now, I point your attention to the fact that uh, with EU for Health, that's the, one of the new um, recent programs from the European Union, there is a specifically attention to the two points that we discussed today, crisis preparedness and also health system and health workforce. So exactly that is you. And for that reason, I think at the beginning, they mentioned that I was taking care of European Kidney Health Alliance for the time being. We need together uh, with you, the nurses, and we are very much needing you in this, uh, bring this problem to the attention of the European policy makers. And we should and can do this together. And um, the next point then, and now I'm really almost finished, is that everything needs to be very well planned in advance. And a nice example of this um, is uh, this uh, paper by, uh, I think, my, my two uh, chairpersons about the CLAMP procedure, uh, how to prepare patients for a disaster, more exactly an earthquake. So uh, advanced planning is important and it is related to the patients, how to disconnect, like in that paper, how to store and stock medication in advance, very important. What diet to apply if they cannot be dialyzed, how to prevent problems by medication like k where to go as a backup unit, and then the preparation of the staff, how to cope in case of disasters, redistribution plans from unaffected to affected units and prevention and timely intervention for burnout. And with this, um, I think I'm finished and I wish to thank you for your attention and I'm open to discussion. Okay, uh, Professor, uh... Hello, hello, uh, Professor Bernholder. Thank you very much for this uh, very much inspiring presentation. Uh, it was uh, uh, really very, very interesting. Uh, you covered uh, uh, many aspects of uh, uh, the, the 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 preparation that uh, has to be uh, done in advance. 
and um, thank you for covering all these uh, areas. Um, I would uh, I would like to ask for our attendees if they have uh, any question that they would like to send uh, for us for um, the remaining 15 minutes that we have for our discussion. And um, in the meantime, um, I would um, I would like to stress uh, very much the importance of um, the preparations that have to be done in the unit um, before uh, any disaster um, may occur. Uh, even if this concerns um, um, a unit or a hospital that is uh, uh, in a disaster prone geographic area or not. Um, as we said, the disasters is, are not only natural disasters, there are also disasters that come from uh, the um, man made disasters or even the disasters that can be caused uh, by a big pandemia like the one that we are experiencing now from COVID. Um, uh, I, I, would, uh, I would like to, to, uh, to ask a Professor if um, uh, he, he's, um, he, he knows of any units that they have in Europe, maybe in the hospital, he, you uh, were um, working in the University Hospital of Ghent. Uh, if um, there were uh, any protocols, preparation protocols uh, for the units uh, to, on the way to evacuate in the case of an emergency. Um, I think uh, the, the most of the uh, preparation and evacuation plans come from Japan, as we know from uh, the bibliography, and from uh, the United States of America. Um, I think there, there should be a policy uh, for um, in a European level that uh, all units are prepared and have a, a protocol for evacuation and how the patients are get prepared. Um, are, are there such protocols in, for example, in the Netherlands? I would like to, to, to raise this discussion because it's very important for, for the, for the, for the staff uh, in the units to be prepared. Um, as far as I know, um, there are disaster plans that are uh, elaborated at the. Um, uh, provincial level in Belgium. Um, they include what needs to be done when something goes wrong with hospitals. And uh, this uh, includes also what uh, the hospital should do um, at large, but also for the different departments. But presently, I'm not aware of, uh, of any specific uh, disaster plan that is related to the dialysis or the nephrology unit. Um, now, I'm, I must say I'm, I'm seven years out of practice, so maybe, maybe that, that happens in between. And I'm pretty sure that for COVID, um, there were a number of uh, intervention plans that were developed actually even before COVID uh, struck Europe. And that, uh, that for that kind of thing, people were prepared even including what should happen with transport of patients etc but detailed evacuation like you should have when the building collapses in the dialysis unit i did not have it at the time i was there maybe someone else can comment on this whether it has changed or whether i'm wrong i, th I think um uh, most hospitals uh from uh, the uh, search that we've done, uh, me and Jane, when we wrote this article in our e-library, uh, was that um, most hospitals have um, uh, internal protocols, as you said, um, and these protocols um, uh, may come from uh, country uh, national protocols. For example, um, in in Greece, where we we have many earthquakes. 
um, we have a particular um, disaster hospital evacuation protocol, um, which um, uh, describes in detail how uh, the, um, the hospital has to be evacuated. Uh, but the, um, th there are some departments that are missing from this. And um, th the one department which is missing is the hemodialysis unit because it's very difficult to evacuate a unit while you have people on dialysis, there has to be a specific procedure. This is the, the, the procedure that you have to teach your patients on how to self disconnect. And this is very, very important to know um, and to be trained how to do it, at least the people who can. So um, this is something, for example, in my unit that we, we, we do, we, we try to train our patients uh, in the case of a disaster like an earthquake on, on how to self disconnect, because this gives them a very high level of confidence and security. So if something happens and no one else survive that uh, this person may, may save himself. So this, this is something I think that has to be in policy in every hospital in every dialysis unit. Yeah. Jane, you wanted to say something. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Professor Van Holder, for the interesting presentation. Uh, I was really impressed that uh, uh, your point at the end of the presentation about the burnout of the uh, dialysis staff, uh, uh, particular in general and particular after the disaster. Uh, so. Um, what do you think? Do we need special plans for the nurses? You know, especially taking into consideration that uh, after the disaster, they may be their family members or houses or damages, or they they don't have any information about their relatives uh, if they uh, uh, what happened to them. Yeah. Uh, do we need special preparation for such cases? Yeah, I think uh, I think yes. Um, um there. Uh, there, first of, I will first answer your question about burnout. So for burnout, um, the people really need to be trained about, um, at least to my opinion, what burnout is and how and what the symptoms are of it, because it's not always clear. Um, I had uh, one one such case in my family, um, and, and, and a medical practitioner, and, and she, in fact, had not recognized it herself, um, although she was medical, and I probably would not have recognized it either if I had not collaborated with that, that article of Mehmet Sever. So you, one has to recognize the signs. The hospital needs to be aware of that it's happening and needs to be in the possibility to make a number of corrections. And also the head of department needs to make a number of corrections because, because otherwise you run in in really very big trouble, and that uh, that necessitates some some way of proactive thinking, studying about the topic, and also reading about the topic, and and taking the appropriate measures. Um, specifically, what you need to do with the nursing staff with disasters um, is very much depending on the local circumstances. Um, the principle is certainly that you do not leave people on duty for too long um, and avoid that they get overstressed. Um, that includes that you need to use the most experienced people at the beginning. And then later on, you can replace them by less experienced people or you can mix the two. Uh, but um, Somehow, the, the predominance certainly at the beginning needs to be with, with the most uh, experienced ones. Um, and, and then you need to call for external help becomes bef when it comes to too much. I must say, for instance, of something that happened um, in uh, now here in Ghent uh, this week. Uh, was that in the midst of, of a really important peak of COVID-19, 
um, the hospital direction of my hospital declared that with Christmas they would build down the hospital beds by 20%. So that was just the message. Uh, if we want to give at least some holiday to all that personnel that's working so hard, then we will, will cut by 20%. And I, I hope that has some kind of psychological effect, at least to the anti vaxxers that they start saying, yeah, when medical care is even reduced, then we are even in more danger than we are nowadays. Although I suspect that it will help. But anyway, I think they, he, the, the direction of the hospital to care of their personnel. And I think that is very much important how to do it. I think you have to think this over unit per unit discuss it, talk about it, and make your plans in advance. The problem is, of course, if you are in earthquake prone area, you know earthquakes may occur. So you can make your plans. If you are uh, in, uh, I don't know what, uh, whatever thing, so you can, hurricanes, floods, th these are things you can prepare for, but something may happen that we are not prepared for. And then of course it becomes more difficult, but still, I think that it is useful that people start actively thinking what they should do. For instance, if the hospital building collapses, if the water provision goes down, um, if electricity falls out, even if you have two backups, you never know what's going to happen, that people at least start thinking about it. And that also answers uh, at least two questions. Um, in the chat, so preparations, okay, I think uh, everybody and depending on the circumstances, training, yes, I think also what the Germans call Kriegspiel, kind of simulation of the problem, and certainly for for which, uh, for what uh, uh, Miss uh, Anastasio, I think it is, uh, said uh, for this uh, Unclamping, unclamping um, of, uh, of of dialysis tubings. That's very important. You know, there is also one question: How the disconnection should be done? I think that uh, the chair people can explain this better. I only can explain what I saw in Turkey. That is that uh, um, the the there was really blood on the walls of uh, dialysis unit, and I think also in Haiti it was the same. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, just simply because people had run out with their needles um, still, or, or part of the tubing still in 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 their body, so that is something that needs to be avoided with the procedure that they are going to describe in one second. Yes, the yes, thank you, thank you, Professor. Um, this is indeed what. Uh, uh, the preparation and the training for the staff and the patients uh, is uh, trying to say that we needed to avoid uh, people um, getting off uh, the dialysis machine, pulling off their needles from uh, their fistula or uh, pulling their catheters. This is something exactly what we need uh, to avoid. Um, the, the, the procedure is called, it's um, called clamp and uh, cut. Basically, uh, we, um, uh, we as nurses train our patients, the patients who can, um, uh, there are some certain criteria, criteria on who can do it, uh, who can perform the, the self-disconnection. Basically, what they do is they um, stop the dialysis machine, they clamp all four clamps of the lines, um, the tubing and uh, the fistula lines, and they cut in between. There is a, a particular point they, ha they have to cut. They have to cut in the middle, and obviously they have to avoid cutting their fistulas because then there will be excessive bleeding. Uh, the, the idea is um, we expect uh, if it is at the and the event of an earthquake, uh, when there is no warning, because if there is a fire or if there is a floating or even if, if even if, of course, it, it, the same applies to um, a, a man-made uh, 
uh, event like a terrorist attack. But usually at the event of an earthquake, there is no time to react. So you would expect the event to be completed. And we all think that uh, the constructions are firm, that the constructions are not going to fail and the buildings will stay there. But for safety reasons, the, the, the hemodialysis unit has to be evacuated. And this has to be done in order and in safety. And this is uh, what uh, the clamp and cat disconnection offers. We describe this um, procedure in uh, our um, uh, article. Uh, it's it's not it's not a new procedure. It's a procedure that that is it is described in many protocols uh, in Japan and, and the, in the United States. Um, it, it offers safety and uh, it gives the possibility for aftercare when the patients come outside the hospital building. They have to come a care uh, into their fistula and into their catheters. So, um, please um, uh, uh, read um, these um, uh, e-library article. You can find it in um, our uh, website, in the EDTNA website, uh, where all the information um, is there. And we are happy to answer any, any uh, questions that you may have. Um, we basically su suggest that um, all hospitals should have a protocol uh, like this with uh, teaching patients how to disconnect um, and um, how to evacuate um, a dialysis unit. Um, I don't know if um, we have um, more time, Jane. I think this is coming. We are coming to the end of of, uh, Normally, they said that was up to 1515. 15. That's also what's marked here. Um, about the needles, I can say it's also depicted in the crush recommendations that I showed in nephrology, dialysis and transplantation. But I think your paper is quite interesting because there are very nice uh, pictures on how to yes. do it. I don't know if I can make a suggestion. Maybe the, the, the PDF of the paper can be distributed to the participants of this uh, of this meeting, if that is possible technically. We also have a video. Um, this is actually from, yeah, we have a video, a training video that uh, we can also perhaps um, distribute for training reasons. Because uh, to be honest, while I was searching in uh, in the internet for any any training material on that i didn't um i couldn't find uh, any any um apart from um uh some training videos on how to to connect and how to disconnect in home dialysis but not during a disaster so yes we could um we could uh, distribute the paper anyway that would be a good idea thank you <laughs> Um, yes, this was a question actually from one of the uh, attendees. Um, I think um, I have taken the the two other questions. I think yes, I'm looking in the chat. Yes, but I I, I agree with um, some other uh, lady. Uh, she says that uh, improvising is no good. Uh, that's absolutely true, of course. Uh, so preparation is very much relevant for better outcomes. I, I fully can support this. Yes, I, I think more or less most um, units. Um, well, definitely in um, in Europe, in Canada, in US, and Japan, they have protocols and uh, it's better to follow those protocols and get prepared and i think there was a question of how often should the training be from one of the uh, attendees um i think it, it depends on the policy but i i would say that at least twice a year there should be um there should be um uh, uh drills 
um, pre pre preparations. Uh, there should be tests to uh, uh, to make uh, evacuations and to simulate the procedure, because um, the more prepared we are, uh, the better we will uh, perform when the time comes. Of course, we, uh, as I said before, in the case of an earthquake, we uh, we all consider that the buildings are safe, and there will be no um, major. Uh, uh, disaster and uh, catastrophes, but we have to be prepared because usually in the buildings and especially in the hemodialysis unit, what um, um, uh, usually falls first is all those panels that usually uh, the lights are. So sometimes these are very, very um, dangerous and uh, it's not on only the case of getting prepared to train staff and patients on how to do certain procedures, but we as um, nurses, we as managers in the unit, we have to look after the place that the dialysis is, the, the, the actual room, and we have to look for possible hazards um, in, in, in this case. So, I would think that in any kind of um, situation, we have to be uh, prepared and to get trained and, um, and have um, a protocol and a policy in place so as to be prepared. So, um, I would like to thank um, everyone that has attended this um, webinar this afternoon. Um, this was um, uh, an excellent uh, presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Van Holder, um, for this uh, interesting um, presentation of yours. Um, it was very much inspiring. Um, everyone who got connected this afternoon, thank you very much. Um, before I close this seminar, uh, I would like to remind everyone that um, the registration for the abstract submission uh, for next conference um, in um, uh, Rotterdam, September 2022, which is our fifth, uh, 15th anniversary, uh, is uh, open and um, we welcome everyone to submit um, your abstracts. Um, have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Take care and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a nice day. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.